Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dina Lehman Kim. I uh, manage the Connect Home program at HUD, and I'm happy to welcome you all today to this presentation. Um, as you all, I'm sure, know, data tracking is really important for gauging how well you're doing, and I'm sure you've come across many different types of products that you can purchase to do tracking and outcome measurement, but the one we're going to talk about today is not only free, but it's something that your housing authority should know very well. It, it, it's the form 0058, also known as the family form, and um, the methodology to use it should also be very familiar to your to your PHA. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the speakers who will go over the form itself and how it can be used uh, for Connect Home specifically, uh, and as well, uh, and, and another speaker who's going to talk about how they are actually using it. So Dylan Sweet is first up. He is a program analyst in HUD's Policy Development and Research Office, and I like to say that he's the Connect Home data guru. And then we have um, Charlie Francis, who is the Assistant Director of Leased Housing and Rental Services for, uh, for uh, the Rhode Island Housing um, Authority. So without further ado, I will turn it over now to Dylan, and thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, and thank you uh, to, to all of you who have come here for this webinar. Um, it's really huge to have the opportunity to sort of add to the uh, collection of data about this topic generally. And um, hopefully uh, after this presentation, you guys will be uh, excited and, and we can sort of get learning a lot about connecting and serving people with internet connections. Um, Not. Oh, so I have control over the slides. Oh, I do. <laughs> okay, so special thanks to um, to Julie and the team at Rhode Island as well, and to everyone on. But, but uh, uh, stuff. I don't know how many of you guys have seen the report, but there are a lot of questions about how many people in our communities that we serve are actually connected to the Internet and in what ways are they connected to the Internet. Um, our first attempt to answer this question um, came uh, right when we were establishing Connect Home in 2016. Um, we surveyed nine communities and we found that uh, only 4% of, of uh, households in the surveyed communities had Internet connections. And that has been sort of the baseline number that we have been using ever since. Um, to the right, you can see that there are a lot more than nine communities involved with the Connect Home for now. We are trying to move forward with uh, some new approaches to learn a little bit more about this, uh, this topic and the communities that we're serving. So, uh, like about knowing, we are often talking about data. Um, we have uh, two big uh, Groups of data we can use to to examine the, uh, this pro connection information that's provided to us by internet service providers who are who are connecting households through the Connect Home program, and then we have the uh, PHA information that's already uh, sort of being collected through all the various uh, data processes and onerous paperwork that HUD makes you file. Um, but we don't actually have any way of linking these two uh, these two pieces of information. Um, because we have it at the citywide level and then we have it at the PHA level. Um, what we have to do to link it is to link it at a household or an individual level. So our big challenge is that it's efficient. Um, that, that ISP information is just tracking total ports, so we don't know how many people are in those households. We don't know the age of people in those households or anything else about them. Um, Spits are slow and can take a long time to administer. Um, and there are other types of, uh, of services that we're trying to provide in this, in this program that are, uh, are go beyond ju just uh, getting home internet connections. So let's measure device access, uh, digital literacy, all different types of um, sort of software issues. So we can plan, and we partnered with Rhode Island Housing to uh, come up with a way that our new approach that would help us to establish a baseline to more implementation and continuing. Uh, you know, continuing the Connect Home program and, and to detect the impact both in the short term and 
medium term and even potentially long term um, of providing uh, folks with internet access. Um, actually groundbreaking research that uh, we've been able to do with Rhode Island Housing and that hopefully you guys can, can join in and engage with. with. I'm going to to link this topic of access to uh, education, healthcare access, public services, um, all the sort of dimensions of our online lives. Um, we now relate that to, to uh, individuals that we're serving. Um, so the question is, how does this work? Um, I mentioned that there are some expensive services that we can buy. We could have done a survey, but we were looking for something that would be uh, uh, as quick and easy to implement as possible, um, and that wouldn't require a lot of paperwork or any additional um, um, really. So we wanted to use pre-existing reporting structures. We wanted it to already be private and secure so that we could look at individual level data, and we were hoping to make it as uh, minimal expensive as possible so that um, we could attract the most potential partners. Um, so we decided that the way that we were going to do that is to use, like Dina said, the family form, the form uh, 50058. Um, one of these uh, report on page two has a couple of fields, 2Q through 2U, that is PJ use only. Um, depending on uh, your organization, you may already be using some of these fields. Uh, we wanted to uh, take advantage of their existence to give uh, you guys a, uh, an easy way to uh, to back up to us um, through existing 5058 reporting structure. So the issues of using this form are that it's a uh, random assignment, uh, which means that um, each quarter that we get an update of, of our uh, 5058 database of the PIC database. Um, individuals who recertify during that quarter can be considered to be randomly assigned, which means we can track progress from quarter to quarter, and we can see changes in our uh, population and the effective of our service um, in, in much more granular detail than just a single survey or doing an annual survey. Um, second is that it's 100% option, so every Household has to fill one of these surveys out, so we don't have to worry about uh, finding an effective sample size. Um, obviously, there's the low cost. Um, then one of the big advantages is that it is, um, you know, inherently linked to the other information that is collected through that form. So we will have things like family size, employment status, income, um, uh, duration, all all of that uh, really important house level information we now have in a permanent way. Linked to the information that we collect in those forms. Um, there's no additional paperwork or reporting to fill out. You just fill in the response to that box, and, um, and it gets submitted right up to us. So, I'm familiar with the survey form. It looks a little bit like this. I don't think we need to linger too much on it. Um, but what we designed. Um, of questions to fit into each of the fields. Um, two key of a hardware and connections question set. Uh, two are, are the outcomes questions. Um, two are program service questions. T digital inclusion and two you contact information. So each of these fields is limited in the number of characters it can contain. So we tried to group similar topics together um, so that we could get snapshots of. Uh, how internet connectivity is affecting each of these sort of dimensions that we expect to see uh, changes in. Um, each possible answer has, uh, with one of those fields, has a, a unique letter combination and uh, and a unique number combination. So that uh, it's it is to to ensure that you are not uh, messing up sort of this difficult um, difficult reporting framework because each answer just has one letter that you can put in. Um, and the order does matter, but, but uh, potentially this makes sure that there aren't any duplications or missed entries. The final field of contact information is slightly different, um, and that's just to collect information for a potential later follow-up, so it's it's not the highest priority. Um, we field to, or the survey to output into CSV data. This is an example of CSV data. It sort of looks like 
um, kind of obligook. The thing you remember is that that uh, stands for comma separated value, and that just means that for each entry, you just then put a comma after it, and that denotes that it's a different field. So um, you'll just put in an answer like A or B or C, and then uh, follow it with a comma before you put in your second answer. Um, so this is an example of the survey that we developed with Rhode Island. Um, these are going to be available to you um, verbatim along with some of their uh, transcription options. Um, here you can sort of see how it's divided into the questions, and then each question has a set of answers with one letter that corresponds to that answer. And so just, uh, you know, a question related to field 2Q, and then uh, you're asked a series of questions within that field, uh, and then the letter that corresponds to the response, and then key in a comma before you answer the next question. And in the way, you can actually take down a bunch of sort of long answers in very simple, short um, keystroke answers. Um, so first of the question, do you have in-home internet broadband service? This is the first question that's on the survey. Um, you can simply answer just A, B, or C. Um, those letters won't be repeated within the field, so the next question will have uh, D or F as your potential answers. But you just pick one of those letters and then type it in, followed by a comma. Um, so here we have uh, sample 2Q answers for yes, the respondent has in-home broadband service, yes, the respondent has a laptop, and yes, the respondent um, received it between six and six months and one year ago. So these are sort of the plain English uh, answers that you might expect to get. And it's actually how it would look encoded in the form. So A, D, comma, H. Um, so they, uh, hopefully frees you guys up from the burden of having to enter in, in any long answers. Um, and it helps on our end with uh, sort of pulling those survey answers back out. Um, the final field, field 2U, where you enter in uh, some of the contact information, um, the field is long enough that it allows us to enter in some of these uh, larger answers just follow a comma. Um, what's this sort of the field, it's not as important as other fields, but it does provide us with the potential to follow up if we were to do a survey later on to get even more in-depth than this allows. Um, obviously, uh, for these answers, there is the potential that people choose to not answer or, or to know an answer, and all of those uh, potentialities are also included in the uh, optional responses. Um, there are some... Uh, Question about how uh, internet access or lack of internet access um, enables individuals to access their benefits. Uh, we know thinking about benefits can be uncomfortable. We don't want any residents to feel sure about how they need to answer. And we want to make sure that it's very clear um, at all levels that, that none of these responses related to these surveys will be used in any way um, on a personal level to affect participation or eligibility. Uh, all of these answers are voluntary and, and uh, will, will exist only for the purposes of uh, providing data for connectivity issues. Um, and that's sort of the meat and potatoes for how to fill out the form. Um, I'm sure there will be follow-up questions at the end about how to do it precisely, and, and we will providing um, uh, the, the documentation on how to do it specifically for each question. Um, I'm going to then sort of pass it off to Charlie, who's been our partner in Rhode Island. He's actually, um, you know, run this at the, at the level, and so he uh, will have perhaps a little bit more to say about how to administer the program. Um, thank you, guys. Thanks, Lynn. Um, yeah, happy to talk to everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, just stop me if you can't hear me, but it seems okay. Um, so, uh, we started doing this effort about a year ago. Um, we are working with two, so we are the state housing finance agency, you know. We do a lot of different things, including mortgages and development, but like many state housing finance agencies, we also operate a housing choice voucher program within our agency. So that's our, the housing authority portion of our agency. So, and two other PHAs in Rhode Island, the Providence and Pawtucket Housing Authorities, um, are working together at, uh, 
as an actual home site. Um, Providence has since received a designation as well, but we're still working together. And so, as that work, um, I believe it was Dylan who originally approached us um, about you know this 5058 data collection effort that HUD was starting to think about, and um, that's a great idea because again, collecting data through a process that every tent has to go through you're going to get a 100% response rate, which is almost unheard of. Uh, we're pretty excited about this, and we're really excited about the data that we're just starting to get. Um, so we started doing this about a year ago with um, yeah, in October or November 2017. So and we do our annual recertifications three to four months ahead of time. So, yeah, we do have about a year or worth of data, or maybe a little more now. Um, initially, you know, we had a paper recertification packet that we'd mail out to tenants, and so we had the survey questions as an attachment. Now, um, we have online recertification, and the great thing with that is we can make the form required. So we, we, we use a program called DocuSign, and we've digitized a lot of our forms. Um, you know, we're still <laughs> working the kinks out, but it's pretty cool. Um, so we're able to collect it there, although... I still have to pull it down from DocuSign and enter it into the form 5058, but we've gotten used to it. I'll show you what it involves. It's not, it doesn't have that much time to processing a recertification. So it involves um, our HCV program manager, you know, and all of our program representatives on different um, codes for the data fields, which Dylan was starting to show you. And enter into the form. You know, they need a couple of refreshers because any any change to this process will always be a little confusing or met with some resistance. But you know, no one has complained about it in quite some time now, so that's definitely an achievement. And um, one little tweak we made is answer on the survey has a letter code, but we only put the letter codes on the version that the staff uses, just to not confuse our tenants. Um, Ellen was talking about this, so the Form 5058 has all these different fields. Uh, most of them are designated for required data that HUD collects, like, you know, household members or ages, income, et cetera. But for PHA use only fields, we have to figure out a way to... So we're using some of those fields for other things, but once Dylan explained to us that we could merge it as long as we put the Connect Home data first, then that was great. And it has become routine at this point. Um, so here's a little picture of what the survey looks like that our tenants see. Um, it's the questions that Dylan was showing you earlier. It's just the format that comes in. I'll leave for a second so you can look at it. And it's entering into our software. Um, this is an example, part of a screenshot of a screen where we enter the 50058 information. And you can see my red arrow here where the Connect Home data actually goes. You know, every PJ has a different software program, but do basically the same thing and have a section where you enter the 50058. I know some other PHAs had to have their software vendor actually open up those fields, but we didn't have to deal with that, do anything special to our software. And the coolest part is what the data actually looks like. Uh, hopefully you can read this okay. But um, Dylan has been sending me this on a uh, quarterly basis, and there's uh, two screens. This is one of them. You see how many, so we have three quarters worth of data so far. You can see you know, how connections we have, you can see when people were connected, different outcomes, um, you know, whether it's engine, employment, whether using the internet for, and you can, uh, you can slice and base it by, um, you know, people are connected or not connected. And um, I feel like I have just started to scratch the surface of this, um, but I can, because isn't the same thing as causation. We can at least see a link between folks that have self-reported, 
either internet or becoming connected recently and for changes in uh, education, employment, and other outcomes. Uh, so I think there's a lot that we can do with that that we have barely even touched. But in, in the more immediate term, using it just to identify which are are connected and who are not so that when we start to actually deploy devices and connections through the home, make sure we're targeting, sounds silly, but you know, you don't want to just give away a bunch of computers to people that already have computers or are already connected. Um, necessarily, you want to focus on the folks who are not connected. And so we can actually do that by collecting this data. We're actually preparing for our first uh, mini deployment next month. mentioned on this slide. And you can um, set orders. You can see uh, it's self-report, so it's not perfect, but about 40% of tenants are reporting being connected. Uh, I would have expected it to be a little higher than that, but then I remembered that, just like me, most of the time, um, men use their phone. Um, and that, that's the dominant thing we find with our folks. Um, which is great for basic things, including our online recertification. It's very mobile-friendly, but not so great if you're trying to apply for a job, do homework, et cetera. And, um, we just, uh, there's a lot of rich data here, and I hope, you know, we all have some time to put our heads together to really understand what it's telling us, because ultimately it should be guiding our deployment efforts. Um, that's it for my piece. So I'll give it back to the uh, moderator and uh, Brianna, and we can... Maybe open it up for students. Yes, thank you, Charlie. So we did receive one question in the chat box during the presentation from Michael Strong. The uh, question was for Dylan. The question is for each field, can you have more than one question? Mike, I can take this one. So each field contains um, uh, a sort of group of questions, or three, I think, to five, depending on the field. They're all related. So each question has only a single response, and then when that field, you enter the responses. So I think on slide 21, we sort of show what that looks like. So what your entry into a field is going to look like is something like this. So A comma uh, B comma H. And so each one of those uh, letters is an answer for one of three questions uh, within one field. I hope that answers the question. Great. Thank you. Received another question from Deb Alperson. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Uh, her question, I believe this is to Dylan as well. Will HUD be able to provide software support to add this? Um, it has to be added. Um, so it shouldn't be added because the fields are required to be on the form. Um, so the PHA use fields are already in any form. So any software you use that is um, that's in Bing. The, um, the Form 558 should already include these fields, but unfortunately, HUD is not going to be able to provide any software support. Great. Uh, we have a question from Maribel Martinez. Uh, this is also for you, Dylan. Uh, the question is, how quickly does the data get turned around? And that is, do communities get reports in intervals or on demand? Um, so communities are not going to receive automated reports yet. We're still working how this will work when we have more people participating. Um, uh, right now it's just, it's just Rhode Island, so we've had a sort of a personal relationship about it. Um, the data are, uh, are sort of quarterly, and there's about a two-month time lag. So it's reasonable to expect that um, sort of after every quarter ends and that quarter is fully submitted, that there would be some visible data to examine. Um, but again, uh, we're not 100% sure on how best to display that information to you, you guys. Okay, um, great. And make an announcement. If you have a question, feel free, feel free to use the hand uh, in your box. Raise your hand and we'll just unmute you so that you can give uh, either Dylan or Charlie your question. Tina, while we're waiting for questions, and I hope we get many more, 
Um, I do have a question for for people who may after today want to use the 5H to, to do reporting for Connect Home, and I hope there are at least several. Um, who do they need to contact if they want to do this? Should they, they can certainly reach out to me, Dina, but um, Dylan would, would be willing to accept um, expressions of interest? Sure. Um, I would be happy, I think, to maybe have a, a follow-up um, a quick conference call, um, and obviously you can, I think my email is somewhere here. Uh, but yeah, we have sort of off-the-shelf material that would allow you to, um, to sort of start this up, um, mm -hmm. sort of what our next quarter is, and I'd be happy to walk you through that process. Great. Thank you. We also received a question from Michael Strom, um, and I believe this is going to be on with as well. Earlier in the presentation, Dylan showed ISP coverage by area. What this found? Um, yeah, I don't know that I showed ISP coverage by area. We don't uh, have information. Uh, so ISPs um, report to the, to the Connect Home team here at HUD um, the number of connections they have um, for specific areas. I think we provide that, that those data to you guys as well. Um, it, that we, we don't tell you the specific ISPs. We can tell you the total connections that um, all, all ISPs have uh, have provided in your community. As far as knowing um, that of a specific ISP in your community, I'd recommend that you reach out to them directly. Um, I think that's that's unfortunate to go. Uh, next question is for Dina or Dylan. It says, are there communities who are not eligible to use HUD Form 5058? Yeah, I think tribes use a different form, um, but I, I don't, my public housing authority should use the 58. Dylan, do you anything else? Um, I think all, all public housing uses the 58. Um, but uh, in general, if there are any, if there's any sort of in in your certification form, like a form form that uh, so that purpose that has a PHA use or a, uh, whatever the organization type use field is, um, could uh, collect it in the exact, exact same way. Um, this is sort of format agnostic. Um, if you're trying to implement it with your multifamily. Um, I know they have a different form. You could potentially uh, do it this way as well. The five zero five nine. Right, right. That's what I was thinking. It's the five. Nine, it's the five zero five nine for for multifamily. Similar. Seeing any other questions in the chat box as of yet? So for your hand or put in the chat. Questions. We'll hold a few minutes for any additional questions. Uh, where can you find information on how to incorporate the 5058? Um, I'm not 100% uh, sure. Do you just mean like up to how to do this? Um, because this, this is, I guess, the material we have on this, um, and follow up with you specifically about how how to uh, incorporate it. But uh, typically, the 5058 should already be incorporated into your recertification process. So you would just um, we would you ask we'll provide you with the list of questions and the formatting for entry, and you would just ask the questions uh, as part of your recertification process when the questions occur in the form. So HUD required forms, so everybody should be using it from some way. Um, mostly at any, everyone with some kind of software. So I won't necessarily see form 058, but the data that you're entering goes into that form, which is submitted into HUD's data system. Um, and says for formatting it? So, and I guess I'm not sure I actually made this clear in the presentation. Uh, the the power in these data are that um, for all of us, 
um, they're formatted exactly the same, right? So uh, I guess, Charlie, your team sort of advantage of a first mover, you got to sort of tweak it to what meets you best. Uh, but uh, moving forward, we're going to use the standard that Charlie um, and I developed for the answering of these questions and the formatting. Um, so the way we, we can look and compare answers uh, between multiple PAs. So what we would provide you is a combination of questions and uh, entry formatting, because the answers um, you know, must be entered in a certain way. Um, so it's all in one problem. Dina, while we're waiting for more questions, I did want to stress something that, that Dylan said, which is that this is, is groundbreaking um, research and reporting. Uh, a lot of Tanks, you know, do research into the digital divide, and and of course the digital divide by definition is talking about people who are low income, and those are the people we serve. So having this kind of data directly from the PHAs um, is really, it's, as as we said, groundbreaking. It it, it really hasn't been done before um, as extensively. I mean, there have been some some reports, but very few, and certainly with not the kind of access that we would have. So um, I really do encourage you to, to participate in this. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure Dylan would be excited to have more data. Right, Dylan? More data is more better. <laughs> I have another question. Um, this question is, where can I find the contact information? That's a great question. For Dylan to express interest in obtaining a survey. that in a chat box now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, if not, we can feel free to contact us and we'll share that information as well. Uh, next question that we have is, if the two Q-T fields are already being used for certain questions, could the next home related questions be added in before or after these existing questions? Uh, Go for it, Charlie. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I'm from Dylan. Uh, all you have to do is, it worked for us at least, you have to put the connect home questions first. Because when Dylan is doing the analysis for us, um, you know, that it reads in that order. You know, maybe some, it's a little bit case by case, but that's the general concept. Right, Dylan? Yep. Yeah. I just put example of the coding again. So there are a set number of questions um, for that are entered in each field. Um, it's important you um, like always adhere to the formatting. Unfortunately, if there are like systemic errors in data entry, we have to throw out the whole field um, because we can be certain what their responses are. But um, uh, each each field has a limited amount of characters it can contain. But if you just put a set number, the the Response first. All feel all of the space in the field after those answers are encoded. Um, can you can put it in? You can use. Um, it doesn't matter to us since we just capture those um, that kind of characters. Okay, with a question from Miss Latoya Nix. Um, she is actually. Um, I can't see the question, so if, I'm taking you off mute if you don't mind reading your question off to us. Um, uh, my question was, um, is it possible for you to email the PowerPoint? Um, sh sure. Is that something that uh, we can do on the um, on uh, your um, moderated potentially? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You can send out the PowerPoint to everyone that was registered for the um, the webinar today. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I don't see anything in the chat box or any other hands raised.
Hi, everybody. This is your chance to ask the experts. So uh, if, if I have, as long as everyone's still online, if you are going to follow up and email with me um, related to this topic, please include 50058 somewhere in your subject line. It just makes it a lot easier for me to manage um, stuff. Okay, great. And we did receive another question. It says, in the follow-up email, could you list the source code to input all of these questions and the unformatted questions? Uh, uh, Charlie, if you could send me the up-to-date um, they're using, and I can just pull check and make sure uh, it's the one that I'm working on, we can we can provide that, I guess, as well with the PowerPoint, potentially. Yeah. I think we may have another question from Ms. Nick. I'm going to unmute her. That's with the hand was raised. One moment. Okay, you're muted, Ms. Nick. So did you have a second question? Oh, ma'am. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. I'm not sure whose hand that was. I'm not seeing it. I might have put it down. We have another question. It says, have, have the residents been to answering these questions? Um, so, they, we just <laughs> make them. Um, we, we haven't gotten any pushback, though. Um, we were doing a paper-based process. You know, there'd be a few that might be blank. But it's not electronic. It, um, it's by. Um, so I'm actually surprised because you know any housing authority will get pushed back on all sorts of things from residents, but I haven't gotten any that I have heard about. And, um, I'll just say that the the form is designed to accommodate refusals, so you know potentially there might be some questions that, that um, people would want to refuse and other questions that they would not. So. You know, that's fine um, as long as entered in the correct format. We follow up question to the last question that says, what about your property managers? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Do, are we getting put, you mean are we getting pushed back from property managers? Yeah, I believe that's what I'm um, Well, so for us, we have a public housing program. We just have a voucher program, so it's mostly small landlords, um, except project-based vouchers. And, and the, uh, these research don't go through the property managers in the first place, so in most cases they don't know about it anyway. Okay. So um, I, she followed up with her question saying, have they been open to adding the work? My staff grumbled about it a little bit at first, but once I realized it wasn't really much additional work, it's, it's been fine. A little bit of that when you're introducing something. Okay, next question we have is, are there any legal concerns that should be considered for any of these questions on a state-by-state -state basis? Concerns. Um. No, but no. A anything new like this that we're adding to our to documents, we'll we'll always run it through our legal counsel. That's that to anybody. Are there the participants 
completing the online forms on their telephone? The yeah, majority are. Um, the site is mobile friendly. Okay. That's the last question we have right now. Any other questions yet? Inbox or any hands? Um, I'm aware of any. Um, I would I would just make sure to. To, uh, to to go to state disclaimer to make sure that everyone's aware that, that uh, information collected is private and won't be used to um, you know to to qualify or disqualify anyone from benefits programs at all. Um, and that's just something that we thought would be uh, conclude. It's not something that even that we have any reason to believe is legally necessary. I just think it's polite. We have another question that states, Charles, have you found any surprising data through this method? Well, um, only about 40% of our tenants are reporting having um, at-home broadband other than a phone. That um, is lower than I would have expected, actually. Um, be more interesting once we start cross-referencing it with demographic data to get understanding like, like are certain demographics that are more likely to be unconnected than others or certain areas of the state. Um, I think we need to dive into it more to really understand the implications. Is there anything you would like to add to this discussion before we start wrapping things up? I've asked my questions, and I am very grateful for everybody's participation and the wonderful questions we have received. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is to really think about using this form for your data collection purposes for Connect Home USA. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. You can send a note to Connect Home hud.gov, and um, we'll be certainly following up with everyone with these presentation materials and the additional information that um, Dylan mentioned about the, the coding and everything like that. All right, if there aren't any more questions, uh, we will consider this webinar to be over. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Thank you to our presenters. Um, this has been informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.